This is a talk about translation skills and competences, sometimes called competencies, but here I'm not making any real distinction between the two. This fits into our subject in the following way. In an ideal world, you're going to train some translators or train people in translation skills. You sort out your needs, as we've seen. From those needs, you get your competences or skills. And we'll see what these terms mean in a minute. From them, you derive your learning objectives or learning outcomes. And then you slot them into your course, that is your entire master program or undergrad program then into each subject, or then you get your syllabus, and down into each lesson, then you do your lesson plan. So there's this top-down processing, and in, as in the best of communist five-year plans, everything works like clockwork, as you can see, big cogs feeding into little cogs. And yes, that's an ideal world that is almost never found. To give you an idea of the mess that we're in with uh, competence theory, here's what it means for perhaps the most influential linguist of our time, Noam Chomsky. You might remember right back at the beginning, uh, Chomsky distinguished between competence as the language system that enables people to produce and understand an infinite number of sentences. So that's competence in the brain there, and that over there is performance. So Chomsky was distinguishing between what's happening in the brain and what is produced out here. It's like Saussure's long parole um, with slight differences. But that has nothing to do, unfortunately, nothing to do with what competence means in education theory. What does it mean in education theory? Well, we'll have to approach that step by step. Uh, basically, uh, people for a long time just talked about skills. And a skill is, well, the, the, what is it? The ability to carry out a task with determined results and uh, taking into account time, energy, or both. Fair enough, a skill. We sort of know what that is, you know, kindergarten skills. Johnny can't tie up his shoelaces. All right. Or six months, no, it's seven months, I remember. Can your baby sit upright? Okay, these are skills that we could codify and we could map onto uh, progression. Now, skills fit into the terminology of competence in many different ways, but I'm just following one map of them here. It's from the European Masters of Translation, 2017, and this is their, their overall map of what happens in translator training at master's level. So you can see their skill... And that's exactly what I just said there, more or less, okay? A skill is knowing how, uh, in French, savoir-faire, okay? The know-how. I know how to do it. Yeah? Knowledge, on the other hand, is knowing that, all right? And it's over here. Uh, we need a certain knowledge in order to be able to translate, and that feeds into it there. Now, what's interesting here is that the classical model of competence says that in competence there are three things all right and the third one is usually aptitude we can see that over here i think if you read then the proven ability to use knowledge so that skill and knowledge all right and then they talk about so personal social and or methodological abilities uh, to work in situations and those abilities, personal, social abilities, would come under the heading here of aptitude in a more classical approach. Uh, so competence, uh, as it is there, is a tripartite notion, uh, or was. It was attempting to see things in a more holistic way than uh, a division into isolated skills. The notion of aptitudes could be taken right back to the Renaissance concept of virtues, uh, that a person is good or good for a certain thing if they have certain character qualities, which would be virtues. So competence in, brings together those three things. It can also be called, though, uh, literacy, oh, twice, 
a capacity to do something or a capability to do something. And people move on to these terms because the waters here have become muddied. It becomes difficult to know exactly what competence means. And this is true in language uh, education as it is in, uh, in translator training. I'll just take you through a short history of the concepts, okay? So, in language education, traditionally, back in the 19th century, and we've seen some of the texts, skills were speaking, listening, reading, and writing. Those were your four skills, and we might like to add mediation or translating to them, but those are skills. Now, the way they were taught was uh, closely associated with uh, what's we might term a deficit pedagogy. That is, you would have to do more listening activities, improve your listening skills, because you weren't hearing things correctly or comprehending correctly. Okay, So the way that these skills entered into the actual training process was through determining what you can't do. So uh, you have to do your alphabet, okay? And you go A, B, C, D, F. Oh, little Jenny, you've left out E. You are a bad, bad, bad girl. You must remember to put E in before F. And little Jenny feels very embarrassed there. And she's so scared that she actually learns to put E before F. And for the rest of her life, she'll be scared of the letter E, okay? Uh, one learns in order to punish, uh, avoid punishment, and ridicule. That would be deficit or negative pedagogy. And the concept of skills was somehow historically associated with that. How did you know what to teach in your classroom? Well, you looked at what the students could not do and you taught that. And the whole thing was negative. Competence then came in as a way of going beyond negative pedagogy. We would look at it as a holistic ability to do something. We're not making people frightened about one particular thing. And we can develop certain things at the same time on the level of knowing how, of knowing what, and of being able to in terms of personality. So for little Jenny and anybody learning the alphabet these days, I don't know. I know that my, my son was taught to sing a song, uh, A, B, C, D, E, F, G. I don't sing it very well. Uh, so uh, how did they learn it? Instead of being scared of it, uh, they got together. It was collective. It was teamwork. Uh, they learned singing skills at the same time as they learned alphabet skills. And there was a kind of holistic approach to the development of a person. So I, I think that in its intentions, uh, competence was a very, very good advance on the rhetoric of, of skills. We can see how this uh, came into translation theory or the, the theory of translation competence. This man here is Wolfram Wils, or he was, he died a few years ago, and he defined uh, translation competence in the following way. He said, well, you've got the four skills in your L1, and then add to them your four skills in your L2. So you've got a person who can work in two languages, and this is getting almost all the way there. And on top of that, there's a translation super competence, which enables you to combine all the other skills. And that's a pretty good model. If you look at it, it's got four, four, and one, nine components all working together. And um, generally, they were based on skills, so they were knowing how. Uh, and that was uh, the beginning of, of a kind of approach to competence uh, that has been used by many people since. Uh, however, the same Wiltz later on sort of gave up on that. And in 1989, he's just talking about skills. That's Fertigkeiten in German, just skills, why not? 92, he's talking about proficiency. And then in the German tradition of uh, Wolfgang Löscher, 1991, uh, was one of the first to do cognitive studies on how people translate. He talked about strategies. Hannah Risku, writing in German, although she's Finnish, uh, preferred the term expertise. So uh, although competence was introduced there, 
a lot of other terms could fulfill the function of describing the thing that translators are supposed to be able to do. Uh, Schefter and Adab, I'm losing, Christina Schefter um, was working in German originally, so I include her there, uh, then added performance ability, which is really interesting because uh, we go through this list, short list of terms, and we find that competence is associated with performance, which, if you remember, was the exact opposite in Chomsky. Chomsky distinguished between competence and performance. Here, the whole terminology has become a mess, and even that Chomsky distinction has been lost. The multi-component model had a, a, a longer history, though. Multi-component, I mean, you, you, you see competence as one thing for translators, and then you divide it up into the parts. So, uh, Albrecht Neubert talked about language competence, as Wils did, but then he said, oh, but you also have to know about the thing you're translating. You have, if you're doing an electronics translation, you have to know something about electronics. Uh, so you have subject competence, and that would be more knowledge-based, and then the transfer competence, which is the ability to translate. So the, the uh, competential model began from a very simple drawing over of, of the language skills thing, and we're starting to add things to it. Here we're adding subject competence. Hatim and Mason do much the same thing. They've got TT, uh, ST, TT processing and the transfer competence. But look what goes on in multi-competential competence. Ampero Urtado, 1996, talks about linguistic competence plus extra linguistic competence, what you know about the world, plus textual competence, you can understand and produce text, plus professional skills, because you have to interact with people in a professional way. Oh, and by the way, you can translate, and that is your transfer competence. Okay, 1996. And these things get bigger and bigger. Marisa Prezas, also working in Spain, these were in Barcelona. These are my former colleagues, okay, so I can't say anything bad about them, because they're very, very nice people. We'll see if I say something bad. Let's see. Marisa Prezas adds to all of that. She says, oh, yes, and they have to know how to use dictionaries. Yeah, that's true. How to use documentation. That is find knowledge, Google around, I guess. Area knowledge, you have to know about the subject matter that uh, Neubert had talked about. Use of instructions, you have to know how to interact with instructions. Oh, and technological tools. You can see this model, this multi-componential thing is getting bigger and bigger. Uh, Preces 98 adds, oh, you have to be able to remember things properly and you have to be able to move between languages quickly and you have to be able to control interference. So you would watch out for false friends, for example, between, um, between European languages and between Chinese and English, you would watch out for syntactic interference, for example. And also in Spain, although this is in Granada, uh, Roberto Mayoral uh, said, uh, you know what, translators also need common sense and curiosity and they have to be able to communicate, and they have to be able to criticize themselves, and they have to be meticulous, and they have to have a very synthetic mentality. And these are all on the uh, level of, of personal attributes or, or aptitudes. Okay? So the idea of a multi-component knowledge, um, competence, just grew and grew and grew until there were so many things there that, that we were going to say, well, yeah, Everything. They have to be able to do everything. Why were these people putting in so many things? Well, one of the reasons was that they were training translators in a four-year university program. Okay, it wasn't at master's level. It would be one, one and a half or two years. This was a four years, and in some cases, a five-year undergraduate program. Well, you have to put in a lot of things to keep kids in in, in school, okay, learning for a long time. Those people 
um, the people around Amparo Hurtado, with a P there, oh dear me, Amparo Hurtado uh, developed the Pacte Group in Barcelona. Pacte, or Pacte, uh, comes from the letters in Catalan, which is the process of acquisition of mm, translatorial competence and evaluation. Okay? Uh, if you want it in Catalan, Proces de Adquisición de la Competencia Traductora y Evaluación. All right. And this, I think, is the most cited model of translation competence uh, that we have anywhere. Here it is over here. I mean, under each of these squares, there's a whole lot of things. So we're, we're really looking at the very top level of it. And it borrows on from what we saw before. There's bilingual, as it was in Vils. We have to know about things outside of the language, so world knowledge, very good. Uh, we have to be able to use technologies and writing tools and dictionaries, that's our instrumental subcompetence. And we have to have knowledge about what we're doing, okay? Uh, <laughs> this is your translation theory and ethics type stuff comes in here. You have to have a certain psychological temperament, and that feeds in there. And then they said, oh, look, you know what? We've got all these very complex things. It must be very hard for them to interact. So there must be a subcompetence for coordinating them all. And that's our strategic competence. Okay, where all these translation strategies are used. Here we know about the strategies. Here we put them to work in connection with all of those. So it's rather a neat looking model, if you like. But... How was it developed? Well, this is not them, actually. It's just people sitting around a table playing with things. Uh, this is the way the, uh, the model was developed. Uh, people with lots of experience in, uh, in training translators get together and talk about what they do and what they think they do. do. And then you know, someone says, oh, I've got a great idea. We need, there must be some way they can coordinate it, so let's call it strategic competence. Yes, that's a great idea. Let's put that in there, all right? Uh, by which I mean there was no empirical testing or empirical basis of this model. It was simply drawn on the experience of teachers who were trying to agree, and they reached consensus on this. Uh, there have been some articles published by PACTA, uh, that is a group of people there, uh, not, not these, but the group of people who signed it, uh, called validation and what they do basically they get students who have been trained in all these things to do a translation then they get students who've been trained in languages but not in translation competence and they prove that the students with the training in translation competence translate better great i mean this is yeah if it were not true that would be interesting i mean hey you're the person who sets the exam you're the person who who train these people, you're the person who's evaluating the translation. If your students didn't do better, you could pack up and go home. But I don't see how the, that sort of empirical research justifies the divisions between these things. Uh, also, if you look at the history of it, which is what I just presented, uh, it came from a very simple notion of just adding things, adding things, adding things, and that could go on forever. Don Corelli, in the meantime, who's working in Germany, uh, talked about translator competence. Translation competence is the ability to produce a translation. But translator competence means becoming a translator, which he describes here as joining communities, different communities, educated users of languages, people who work in specialized fields, traditional tools and new technologies, okay? He, he sees this as a social process whereby one person enters into different communities at the same time. And this, I think, is very, very interesting. As soon as we realize that our graduates are not all becoming translators, they are going into these other communities, and the learning process, the gaining of competence, is also a fact of joining communities. So this is quite different. Of course, Corelli is just adding things on to the basic model of translation competence. Others have had added other things, like, for example, speed 
This is Vils. He came back and added speed first. Everybody else forgot about it. Although instrumental competence could be speed, I guess. Social networking is, is dealt with a lot by Douglas Robinson, and you can see that at work here in, in Kerali. Um, dressing well. I'm not joking. I, I, I actually put this in one of my books, that when you're feeling really bad and you've got a hang hangover and you have to meet your client, uh, remember to dress well. And I think I was at a conference many, many years ago where somebody was talking about how uh, conference interpreters had to learn to use makeup properly because this was part of their professional skills. Well, okay, anything could be put in there. The problem with the multi-component approach to competence is that reality will always be ahead of you and you will always be catching up. Why? Because the profession is changing. Why is it changing? I think basically because technology is pushing it on. Uh, we go into increasing fragmentation and we know that our graduates go into many other places. Uh, I think Paul Gruber at the University of Melbourne has said a similar thing. He said, you know, competence models will always be behind. There's no limit to what people can put in. There's no way of controlling what goes into the stew. And that's a real problem. The models do evolve. And here I, I'd just like to show you what happened. This is uh, not the Pacte model. This is the European Masters of Translation model. Taxonomy just means you divide it up into little groups. And this is the way they divide it up in 2003. And it's a fairly good model because it looks like a wheel. And in the middle, you've got service provision, which means that, that, that the people there are able to pull on all these different things and deliver it to a client. And this is, this is good. It's got the technology there. It's got information, documentation. It seems to have lots of good, good things there. However, in 2007, it was revised into this, which is a bit like a multicolored donut. All right. And what's interesting is that a lot of it becomes service provision and personal and interpersonal components. Okay. Uh, so all of that there uh, the two would be uh, developing the person, developing a person able to work in business. And translation in, is just one part of it. Uh, you could see that there, but there are some underlying uh, changes there in that uh, here it's very much focused on producing a text. Here it's very much focused on delivering a service and talking with people. And it's very interesting to, to wonder why we went from one to the other and whether or not it's not just a random process of people agreeing around a table again or was there any empirical input how did it how did people get the the enlightenment need, needed to go from one to the other i really don't know the problem with uh, multi-component models i think is that there's not enough evidence for the category basically. Uh, they're based on consensus, and consensus is a valuable thing, and I'm not going to deny that, but it would be better to have some evidence, I suggest. Um, at base, they are designed to serve a profession. People ask, uh, what is translation competence? Well, it's what a professional translator has, and so we're going to imitate it. But nowadays, we know that the people we train are going into other professions, so there's that Kerali type awareness of entering other communities as well, which upsets uh, much of the traditional basis of the very notion of, of translation competence. And uh, there's no developmental aspect to them. They don't say how you get better in something or how do you measure when you're improving. That is, they don't help you with what uh, Dorothy Kelly calls the sequencing of activities. And um, they don't account for error. I mean, they, they, huh. when you're training people to go into a job, you can say, oh, well, you know, little Jenny there, who was back in primary school learning to do the alphabet, uh, she has now got 54% instrumental competence and 84% service provision competence or whatever. Uh, but 
we don't know what error is, what they can't do. We've lost track of what people are not able to do. And I'll return to that in a minute. In sum, when you produce a model like this, you can't be wrong because there's no way anyone can prove that you're wrong. That is, there's a fairly random basis for the categories. On that, that, that's my presentation of where competence theory is in the field of translation, okay? I just want to um, give a few considerations of what we can do with the models of competence and how they can address some of the problems that we face. Here's a problem. Machine translation, these days through neural machine translation, is becoming very, very good. And it can do lots of the things that translators were doing. So we could go back and look at the models of competence and, and start thinking again, now, which of those things cannot be done by a machine? And those things that cannot be done by a machine, that's the things I should be training people in. I mean, train them how to use the machine. Uh, that is, I train you how to do post-editing, uh, correcting machine translation. But then what are the skills that are automation-resistant? That is, cannot be done by the machine. And you've got a little model here that the most automation-resistant skills are those that are non-routine, that is, not repetitive, it can't be done by a rule, there are no rule books for that, and a cognitive rather than manual. So, for example, uh, making decisions about textual strategies, or how to adapt a text for a particular market, or how to rewrite a text, or how to win a client in a negotiation. Uh, these things are obviously non-routine cognitive skills that cannot be automated. And those are things that we might want to uh, focus on in, in translation. You could also put in there post-editing, uh, since the machine does a lot of the work and post-editing is uh, work on the non-routine aspects that have to be corrected. With that, we can go back actually to this, uh, this uh, shift from uh, 2003 to 2017 in this model. And what we find here is that the added weight given to personal and interpersonal and service dimension, okay, all that there, and if you like the cultural element, they are actually beefing up the percentage of automation resistance skills. So I think although I don't know how they got from one to the other, I think the way they're going uh, makes sense historically as a response to machine translation. But that's something I would really love to see justified empirically. Here's my second consideration. We have a growing body of research uh, done by people who look at the way translators translate, that is, they look at uh, translator cognition, uh, and they compare experts with novices. Okay, and this is one of them. I'm, I'm taking this basic list from uh, uh, Englund Dimitrova. That's her book there. Notice that she focuses on, on expertise uh, rather than on, uh, on competence. But expertise is that notion where, where we look at what people get better at. How do they become experts? And there's quite a few things we can say. And we have actual data to justify it. So they all take the form, the more experienced the translator, the more they use paraphrase, process large units, review their work, look at the translation more than at the ST, process top-down rather than bottom-up, refer to the translation purpose, that's a bit of Scopos theory coming in there, rely on the knowledge that they've got in their head rather than what they're going to go and find by Googling around the place, uh, they can talk about their work more, they have more personal theories, and they make references to the client. Okay, um, I, I dealt with these things elsewhere. I just want to show that there are things that we do know about expertise, and that this, I think, should be uh, a basis for how we think about competence. But it hasn't been done. Uh, people have thought competence is one thing, whereas these are really procedures, cognitive activities. They are closer to the smaller things that we would still want to term skills, I think. 
Okay. The most interesting is is the last one here, and I've I've mentioned this before, probably, uh, that that the more experienced translators uh, work on the big problems, uh, and um, and work very quickly on the little problems. That they have a different way of of uh, distributing their effort. So I, I just leave that there. I think that there's a whole lot of knowledge there that we're not drawing on and we could draw on to rethink uh, the nature of translation competence if we still want to use that term. Uh, consideration number three. Uh, I think that if we are training people in what's called a terminal degree, like this is the end of your education, folks, because next year you're going to be working. And, and this is it. This is, there's no namby-pamby stuff. You've got to get out there and work and you've got to be good. I think that if we're in a terminal degree, we might have to go back to some kind of deficit pedagogy and start thinking about what you can't do and what you've got to learn quickly. Now, Anna Lafever did this in a doctoral thesis it's on intergovernmental organizations, basically the United Nations, but she also looked at the European Union. And when you go into the United Nations for two years uh, as a, a, a novice translator there, you have your work corrected by a reviser. So what she did was uh, go to the revisers with a questionnaire and uh, had a list of, I think, 42 or so, a long, long list of skills. She called them skills. And they asked them, which of these are the most frequent things you correct? And then which of these are the most important? And she got lists of skills in accordance with their, their here put together, importance. And you can see that at the top of the list, in both cases, uh, we have the core skills of translation, the ability to write well, the ability to, to construe a text well. Uh, capture nuances, okay. Language skills are the things that they're looking for the most, or more to the point, the things they are missing the most. Uh, so this is uh, is a caveat. It, it's it's a warning. Uh, we may be going towards interpersonal business type skills because we see machine translation approaching us, but at the same time, if we are training people for this kind of organization. What they want at the top are very, very high level language skills. Uh, by the way, in both cases, technology is right down the bottom of the list uh, for a very simple reason. Uh, when you get a job with these organizations, they train you in their technology. I'm afraid I have no corresponding information on the um, uh, skills required of official translators in China. That might be an interesting doctoral thesis for someone to do. Number four consideration. Uh, this is my little bit. Okay, in some of the literature there, if you go through and read up about uh, translation competence, you might find uh, references to uh, a minimalist approach, which is there in 1991. And this is a very simple model. It says that uh, translation competence, I still used the term back then. I don't think I want to use it anymore, but let's, let's go with it. Translation competence, well, I could just say, it's the combination of two skills, and these are skills, right? The ability to generate a series of more than one viable text, translation, TT1, okay, for a pertinent start text. So you've got a text you're working on, there's a problem there, to try to solve the problem, you say, oh, it could be translated like this, 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 or this. And if you can do that, you're halfway home. That's what a translator can do. And then the second one, the ability to select only one viable uh, translation from this series. Okay, so quickly I can say, I'm going to go with that one, and not the others. Quickly, speed is part of it. And then with confidence, because that's what I see translators developing, as they become better and better, they simply become more confident and they can incorporate ethical criteria into their choices. Okay, now that's a minimalist definition. Why do I want to defend it? 
Well, I think the multi-component models, uh, as we've said before, have no end, and are losing track of what translation is, I suspect. This model at least concerns translation and nothing but translation. If afterwards you want to add anything else in, or see translators going on and entering any other kind of professional community, that's great. Why not? But if we're talking about translation competence, hey, this is the translation part of it, I suggest. It can address the problem of machine translation because machine translation is doing the first bit well and can be used to help us do it better, but the selection process is done badly by the machine and that's where we enter as people who use language at a very, very high level. So machines are on the first bit, the generative bit, uh, the human skills come in the second bit with a selective bit. The model, I didn't say this in 1991, but, but these days I'm, I'm, I'm interested in, in the studies of translators' personality, and particularly of uh, an idea that translators have a high tolerance of ambiguity. This means that people who are not perfectionists, who don't get upset about categories that leak into other categories, and can remain calm under crises. Okay? That's called tolerance of ambiguity. It's associated with, with, uh, with good language learning skills as well. And I think that somebody who can do this very quickly uh, is doing, uh, performing a task for which there are no rules. That's, it's, it's underdetermined. It's an indeterminate activity, I should say. There are no rules for which one you select. When there are rules, as I say before, it's terminology or grammar. You need a certain ability to have um, to tolerate tolerate uncertainty. I think is what I would say instead of ambiguity. But ambiguity uh, is the traditional term in uh, in psychology. I, these days, I would also say that this minimalist focus on translation highlights a kind of language competence or skill that can be taught in a language class. That is, if in a language class you recognize still the four basic skills and you want to add a fifth one called mediation or translation, this is what that fifth skill might look like. Might look like. It also helps us distinguish translation from the free flow mixing of languages that we have in translanguaging, for example, without tying it to the restrictive notion of word-for-word word or phrase-for-phrase phrase replacement. This is a very creative process that should be appreciated as such. And that's what we have to say about translation competence. <laughs>